let's now take a look at a few concrete examples of uh, how these matrices for J, Jx, Jy, Jz and the rotation matrices look for some specific simple examples. We will start with the simplest case of them all. Actually, no, we are not going to start with the simplest case of them all. That's actually way too trivial. Remember, we have already figured out, or we had already figured out in the previous course, the J takes values 0, half, 1, 3 by 2, etc. And for every such J, M takes values from minus J, minus J plus 1, all the way up to plus J. Now, the simplest possible value, of course, would be J equal to 0, where M takes only one value, M equals 0. So, there's only one state, 0, comma 0, and this is a state which does not change when you rotate the coordinates at all. So, this is what we would usually depict as a spin 0 system. And for a spin 0 system, the effect of rotations is really rather trivial. So, next case that we are going to talk about, the first non-trivial case, also happens to be a very important case, is j equals half. For j equals half, we know that m takes two possible values, plus half and minus half, and so we have two simultaneous eigenstates of j square and jz, and they are labelled by the values of j and m, so j equals half, m equals half here, and j equals half, m equals minus half here. We could either use a ket notation or we could use a corresponding matrix notation. Of course, if we are using a matrix notation, as you all know, you have to choose a basis and the obvious choice would be we choose these two elements, the ket half half and the ket half minus half as our basis and uh, as is the standard rule when you choose a basis, the basis elements themselves get represented by column vectors 1, 0 and 0, 1. Now, in this case we know that j square acting on both these states give you half into half plus 1 h cross square times that state back. So that's 3 fourth h cross square times the state back. While jz acting on these states will give you plus half h by 2 h, h bar and minus half h bar times the state back. That's sort of obvious because these states are eigenstates of j square and jz and those values that I quoted right now are just their eigenvalues. Of course, the matrix representations of these two operators, j square and jz, once we have chosen the basis that we have chosen, becomes very, very simple. j square, in fact, becomes a multiple of the identity matrix because it has only one eigenvalue 3 4 h cross square, whereas jz is a diagonal matrix with diagonal elements h cross by 2 and minus h cross by 2. So it is h cross by 2 times our familiar old sigma 3 matrix. Now what about jx and jy? It turns out that it's easier to first work out the matrix representations for j plus and j minus because from our general theory we know what j plus and j minus does to the states. Just to remind you, j plus acting on ket jm would give you jm plus 1, the ket, times the factor. The factor happens to be root over j minus m into j plus m plus 1. On the other hand, j minus acting on jm would give you the ket jm minus 1 times the factor in this case being root over j plus m into j minus m plus 1. And using these, it's trivial almost, to show that j, j plus acting on half half, of course, gives you zero. You could figure that out by both using the fact that when j is equal to m, root over j minus m into j plus m plus 1 is zero. The factor in front is zero. But perhaps more fundamentally, it's easy to see that uh, m equals half is the highest possible value that j m can take in this for this particular j and any attempt to raise it further would annihilate the cat. On the other hand, j plus acting on half minus half 
is the ket half half times factor and in this case the factor is very very simple it's just h cross itself oh when i quoted the results of j plus j minus acting on jm before just a while ago i forgot to put in the factor h cross of course you could often be using the units h cross equals 1 or call what we are calling j h cross times your j in either case of course what you are going to get is no h cross at all just j plus half minus half is equal to half half a very similar calculation with j minus simply shows the j minus acting on half half lowers the eigen value to half minus half with a factor of h cross and j minus acting on half minus half is of course zero this makes it very easy for us to write down the matrix elements just remember the basic idea is or well, this case is too simple to even go back to the basic idea but the basic idea is always Im important to keep in mind you expand the basis the result of the operator acting on basis vectors which is a vector in this case in terms of the basis vectors take the coefficients write them down the columns so j plus acting on the first basis vector is zero so the first column of j plus matrix will be 0 0 on the other hand j plus acting on the second basis vector is the first basis vector times h cross plus second basis vector into 0 the second column will be h cross 0 and so on so going this way we find that j plus is h cross times the first column is 0 0 as i said the second column is 1 0 whereas for j minus the first column will be notice that there is a zero times the first basis vector plus h cross and the second basis vector here so there will be zero h cross of course i have written the h cross outside so this is what j minus is going to look like now that we know j plus and j minus finding out jx jy matrix is trivial because all you have to do is j plus realize that j plus plus j minus by 2 is jx and j plus minus j minus by 2i is jy and using these two very simple results we can write down their matrix elements for jx and jy of course these matrices should be very familiar to all of you apart from the factor h cross by 2 outside the matrices are nothing but sigma 1 and sigma 2 respectively we had already seen that jz is h cross by 2 times sigma 3 so for spin half the sigma matrix has play a very very important role simply because the angular momentum generators or sorry angular momentum operators happens to be just the sigma matrix is up to a factor of h cross by 2 well now that we have found out the angular momentum operators in matrix form is pretty easy to write down the rotation matrices so here jy is simply h cross by 2 sig h cross by 2 sigma 2 and if we use the standard property of the sigma matrices which you have definitely learned and worked with in your assignments even it is the i by h cross beta jy assembly with the i beta by 2 sigma 2 and using the standard property this is cosine beta by 2 times identity the 2 by 2 identity matrix plus i sin beta by 2 times sigma 2 okay uh, why are we looking at this if you have forgotten let me remind you of what we figured out in the last lecture if we are given an uh, an arbitrary rotation with uh, euler angles alpha beta and gamma then just to go back to the material of the last lecture the matrix element dj m prime m for this particular rotation through alpha beta and gamma works out to be simply this quantity the i gamma m plus alpha m prime times another matrix element the small dj m prime m beta and small dj m prime m beta is nothing but the matrix element 
of e to the power i by h cross beta j y, the rotation operator through an angle beta about the y axis, sandwiched between the bra j m prime and the ket j m. Let me remind you once again that this is the convention or this is the rule for passive rotations. For active rotations, there will be a change of sign. So now let's get back to our case. We need the small dj half m prime m, which is nothing but the matrix element of this. But in we have already already written down the matrix version here, and so we have cos beta by two down down the diagonal, and i, of course. Multiplies by minus i, which is already there in sigma two minus i and plus i on the two diagonals, two off diagonal terms, and gives us a sine beta by two here and minus sine beta by two on the in the other off diagonal. Notice that many books will have small dj matrices written down with opposite signs on the off diagonal terms, but that's simply because they are really talking about active rotations as opposed to passive rotations that we have. So, given this, finding out the curly DJ is very trivial. But let me point out this very important thing. Remember, when we did the Euler rotations in quantum mechanics, we always do Z Y Z rather than Z X Z, the way it is usually done in classical mechanics. And the reason you can see right there in front of you, since sigma two is purely imaginary. By the way, so is the GY representation matrix for any small j, not just j equal to half. So I sigma sigma two in this case is purely real and it's exponential. It's purely real. So we have a purely real DJ matrix to deal with here, and all the complex phases comes from the simpler to handle sigma three matrix, which is already diagonal, so it's trivial to exponentiate. So we can either write down the exponentials of those two operate of the operators into the i alpha by two sigma one and into the i gamma by two sigma three, or sorry, both sigma three of course, and multiply these matrices. Or I could just use the formula we had derived in the last lecture. Either way, curly DJ half m by m just turns out to be this. And this formula gives you the rule by which you could talk about action of rotation of coordinates on any ket. Remember, I am saying any ket, but we could could just as well think of the same rotation in two ways: one in which the kets rotate by this matrix acting on the column vector representing the ket, so that will be alpha, beta, two complex numbers. So alpha. Half half plus beta half minus half will be represented by the column matrix alpha beta, and this rotation matrix acting on that will tell you what happens to that column, that ket when you rotate your coordinate system. Um, we could equally well think of the same change by saying that the ket stays the same, the operators rotate as we had already discussed. Remember, the system is not changing in this case; only the coordinates are. So, of course, the numbers that you use to represent the system, which are often coordinate dependent, will, may or may not change. When I say, say may not change, I mean will not change for scalar operators, operators which commute with angular momentum generators. But almost for every other object, the numbers change. The numbers can change either by the ket changing, operator remaining the same. Or the operators changing, ket remaining the same. Here, I might add that you could even look for a more complicated situation or complicated description, where both kets and operators change in some way, while leaving the matrix element the same. You must have already done that when you did changes of picture in quantum mechanics. However, we were we are usually not going to talk about such complicated descriptions because these simple descriptions either get changing, operators not, or operators changing gets not works fine for us. Now, what about other j values? What I'm going to do next is just show you the results for j equal to one. J equal to one, m has three values, plus one, zero, minus one, so three gets. 
which we choose as our basis, so they are represented by the column vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1. I am not going to show you details of this, but it is very easy for you to work it out yourselves. J square again is represented by an identity matrix, which in this case is trivial, is a 1 into 1 plus 1 h cross square times the identity matrix. Jz is a diagonal matrix. Of course it is because both of both J square and Jz are because we are using the eigenvectors of J square and Jz simultaneous eigenvectors to actually write down the matrix elements. The basis has been chosen to be the eigenvectors of J square and Jz. So these two operators will, will definitely be represented by diagonal matrices. J plus J minus you can easily figure it out using the rules that we already know of J plus J minus acting on the states. I am just going to write them down for you. J plus is a leading subdiagonal matrix. All elements are zero except on the first leading subdiagonal, which is really a sign of the fact that J plus raises the eigenvalues by one, the J minus eigenvalues by one. It so happens that both the non-zero matrix elements are h cross times root 2. Let me warn you that that's a special feature of j, j equals 1. For other higher j values, j plus will be a leading subdiagonal matrix with the first subdiagonal above the diagonal being non-zero, every other element being zero. But all the elements in a leading subdiagonal will usually not be the same for a general J. For J equals 1, the rule is very simple. J plus is simply this. J minus, you can work it out again, or just use the fact that J minus operator is the adjoint of J plus operator. So J minus matrix has to be an adjoint of J plus matrix. And in this case, adjoint simply means transpose because the matrix is purely real. And from these, it's easy to find out Jx and Jy. So please work it out yourself. Once again, notice that Jy is purely imaginary, as it has to be because Jx and J plus and J minus have purely real representations in our phase convention. And hence, small dj for j equals 1 will also be purely real matrix. And that's the case for every j. So I will leave this as a homework for you. Figure out, carry out these calculations. Of course, remember, every one of the steps that I have discussed is a potential homework. Work it out yourself at home. Also, work out the rotation matrices for j equals 1 case. So that's all about specific examples.